as Elias mentioned, I'm Brady Halesh, and I'll talk about containers uh, and just try to understand how they work. First of all, a little bit of myself. Uh, currently, I am backend software engineer at UFS. Before, I was working at Arctur, so really not, nothing really special. So how did I get here then? Uh, basically, I was working with Docker and containers for like seven years, and much of that time, I didn't really understand what's going on under the hood, because if you use Docker and Kubernetes, uh, these tools really hide the complexity real well. Move the microphone to the right side. Oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, yeah, uh, Docker, Kubernetes really hide the complexity, but as I digged into the cybersecurity, I realized that I can't really protect something I don't know it exists. So, let's start. What is a container? Well, if we Google it, uh, containers are lightweight packages of software that contain all the necessary elements to run in any environment. Okay, great. If you ask a colleague, uh, you'll probably hear uh, this kind of answer, which is, oh, you mean Docker. It's something like a virtual machine, but a little bit lightweight. Well, truth be told, there are just some processes. Uh, processes that are running on your host. And now the major difference between a container and a VM is that uh, containers share the host kernel while virtual machine, virtualized hardware, and then run multiple operating system on that, on, that, on that single physical machine. So this is how it looks like, and you probably all see this picture before. So yeah, on the left there's VM, there's some infra, you have some kind of uh, hypervisor that allows virtualization, and on the right, the containers, uh, you have just one OS, and then you have some kind of a uh, container runtime on top of it that orchestrates the processes running. Okay, so why does the shared kernel matter from a security standpoint? Well, it turns out that when we write applications, they, ru they run in user space. And that user space is not really pri uh, privileged one. So basically, whenever we want to open a file, establish a connection, allocate some memory, whatever, we, use, uh, we have to communicate to the kernel, and this is done through the system call interface. So basically, the application uses a system call interface, talk with the kernel, kernel uses device drivers, and then talks to the hardware. Okay, uh, this presentation will be demo heavy, so let's get started with it. And for first thing, I'll just show that container is just a process, right? So if I go like docker run, uh, by the way, everything I show will be available on GitHub, and also all the scripts I run will be available on GitHub, so you can just follow along. Okay, so I will run it in detached mode, so I'll put it in the background, and I will run some Alpine, and I will just sleep with it, right? So, uh, then I can use on Linux uh, PS to s uh, search through processes that are running on my machine. So I can search for any process that runs sleep, and I could find it. So yeah, container is just a, just a process that is on our machine. Okay, so, but if it's just a process, what, what, does a pro, what makes a process a container? Well, there are three things. Well, there are more things, but three major things are we need to have some kind of isolation because processes should be run independently and unaware of each other for the containers and also of the host on which they run. There needs to be some encapsulation. Basically, it's great that when you run a process, everything is already packed there. So you don't need to manually install anything. Like npm install something, we don't want to do that. And the third thing is there also needs to be some kind of resource restriction. So, <clears throat> for example, if there is a rogue container that can consume all of the resources for a new host, basically, it can crash the host. Okay, so let's start with these three things. And the first thing I'm gonna talk about is the isolation part, which is given to us by a Linux uh, feature, a kernel feature, which is called namespaces. So what are namespaces? Uh, namespaces allow a process to have its own isolated uh, instance of a global resource. So like process IDs, network interface, et cetera. Basically, they help us limit the potential impact of malicious process. Uh, and changes inside that namespace are only visible to the processes inside the namespace, but not to the host, right? Okay, so we have multiple type of namespaces. I won't go through, the, with, uh, through all, but uh, two which I will show today are the Unix time sharing namespace and process ID namespace. The, now Unix time sharing namespace allow us to change host name of the host without affecting the host, 
and process ID just isolates process IDs. Because for example, when you run a container, uh, you don't see processes running on the host, right? So yeah, uh, basically the default uh, namespace layout is something like this. Now, the ordering here doesn't really matter. What I wanted to point out here is that each process needs to be exactly one type of the namespace. And by default, when the system D is run, uh, it gets assigned to the default ones, to the root ones. And then each process that gets spawned from there inherits the parent namespace. So that's why every process on your host can see, basically if you don't isolate namespace, you can see everything, right? Okay, so in the first demo, what I'll try to do is just I will try to separate the UTS namespace. So I want to make that my container can change the host name, but not affect the host itself. So let's do that. Now, the first thing when you're working with uh, Linux is it's a good thing to know there's manual pages. It's really useful. And now, for instance, I can read more about namespaces. I go like man, namespaces, and I get some information, right? some types, whatever, and also namespace API that allows me to manipulate those namespaces. Okay, great. Uh, the API I'll be using, it's unshare. So let's check what unshare does. And it just runs a program in a new namespace. Well, I have to write unshare, some options, and then program to run. Okay, as I said, I'm gonna isolate the uh, UTS namespace. So I can go unshare, UTS, and then I'll spawn shell, right? And now I check the host name and I see I'm still on DragonSec, right? Now I can change the host name to still here. I can check the host name. It was changed, but if I exit back to the host, I'm st it's still DragonSec, right? So we, we isolated the host name. We could do changes in it and didn't reflect on the host. This is great. But security-wise, not really useful, I guess. Uh, what's more useful is to isolate process IDs. <coughs> So yeah, because if you're in container, you have access which processes are running on the host, this is additional attack vector that attacker can abuse. And through some Linux magic, it's really easy to abuse it. Um, so yeah, let's do it. Let's try to separate the process ID namespace, and I'll go just like unshare, but this time PID. Uh, now I have to use fork, because I wanted shell to be a fork of unshare, else it doesn't work. And I spawn shell again. Okay, now I can check the process ID of the current process, and it's one. So basically we've separated the process ID namespace because it's again started at one because on host one is systemd. Okay, now let's check all the processes on the, on the host. And we failed, right? Because we see all the host uh, processes that are running on the host. So why did we fail? Well, basically it works, but it does, doesn't work. Well, we have to figure out what actually even PS does, right? So again, we don't know a thing about some command. We can again search manual pages, right? Memps, and ps just reports a snapshot of the current processes. Great, and because I know where to search for, if you search for reading, it tells that this ps works by reading the virtual files in slash proc. Okay, uh, we don't know anything. Let's brute force our way, our way through to some goal. Uh, okay. So we new, need a new slash proc, so basically that means that because it's a slash proc, we need a new root, right? So let's create a new root. How can we do that? Well, there's a, another uh, Linux feature, kernel feature, which, which, yeah, which is called change root, right? So change root. Oh, God damn it. Sorry. Can I put this one? Uh, Mike doesn't like me. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, I was talking about something. Uh, yeah, change root. It's used to run a command or interactive shell within a new root directory. Simple enough. So basically what we want to do, for example, if the gray area is our host file system, we have a new root folder in which we'll have our new root. And for example, when a process will use the new root, it won't be really aware of the uh, root, I mean file system outside, so the gray area. Okay, so let's use change root. I'll just create a new directory, which is tmp new root, and then I will use change root. So I don't know about change root. I can again check manual pages, run a command, blah, 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 and I have also instruction how to run it. So let's run it. Change root, tmp new root, and then I will run 
shell, right? And it doesn't work. Why it doesn't work? Well, we switch truth, and we need shell inside that truth, all right? Because basically we need the command to run the command. <laughs> and now it's just empty the folder. So we are brute forcing this. What can we do? Well, we can just, we are developers, and we can go to the internet and write downlo download Alpine. Uh, because we're great at downloading stuff, so. And we copy link pr for the mini root file system. Uh, copy, save link, copy, I guess it's copy. And then what I'm gonna run, okay, I'll just prepare myself here. What I'm gonna run, I'll ju just gonna wget, wget, wget. <laughs> And I, yeah, I'm retarded. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I used to do this in Firefox. But I, copy link address, that would be better, right? Okay. Okay, wget, this URL. I'm gonna pipe it into standard out so I can extract it on the fly with star, with star, right? To extract because this is tart and zipped. Uh, I'll pass to untar it and also dezip it and I will place it in my TMP uh, new root, right? And now if I check my TMP new root, I have the file system of Alpine distribution here. Okay, so let's, uh, let's try again. Now if I run the change root on the new root and run shell, basically it works, right? Because now I have shell installed there, installed. Okay, let's combine those two uh, commands together, so. I'll go like unshare, PID, fork, but this time instead of running shell, I'll just use change root, right? And then I'll go TMP, new root, and now the change root requires me to specify a command that will be run after the change root, and then I'll go bin shell, right? So basically just glue together those commands. Okay, what do I have now? Nothing, well that's better, security wise it's better, but still not what we want, so. Uh, now we know how PS works, by using some procs, but what really is that proc, right? So again, we go to the manual pages, proc. It's a pseudo file system and provides us interface to the kernel data structure, right? It's commonly mounted, at slash proc, it's auto mounted, but you can also mount it by hand. Okay, let's do that. And I go like mount, t, proc, then some arbitrary name, which is, let's say, dragon sec, and I go like slash proc, right? And now, We've just replicated what containers do, right? You only see the processes that are running inside my container. Okay, great. So basically when I was telling you about Alpine stuff, you're probably thinking to yourself, oh, that's why the Docker images are used for it. And yes and no, because you can achieve this by, in a really smarter way, but just using additional flag, but I wanted to brute force. Uh, basically the Docker images, as I said, are used to pack dependencies together to your process. So. Let's check that out. Uh, okay, first of all, uh, if, I mean, Docker images are built in a bit different way because let's imagine if they did just what they did, it would mean that each container would have to pack its own version of Alpine or Ubuntu, Linux or whatever, and for example, if we had five containers uh, depending on the same image, it means that we will have to download that image five times, which is expensive for a hard drive, expensive for the wallet, if you have a registry on the cloud, etc. right? So. Uh, Docker uh, decided to do this a bit smarter, right? So, on the left there is a Docker file, and you have basic node something, Alpine, you uh, copy package.json and then run npm install. It does nothing except bloat, bloats up. And what this translates to is on the right. So basically what's gonna, going on is that the from layer is the first layer and it's separated. Then the copy creates a new layer, and that copy that layer is just a diff on the previous layer, so it contains just the packages. And the third layer is what happens after the npm install, which means that the diff here is just the node modules. Okay, so they structured it this way, but this, this still doesn't solve the problem, right? So, how does this look inside the registry? Well, those layers of a Docker image are just random layers, and they don't really belong to anything. They just, any image that fits to need it will just download it. So how? When we say Docker pulls something, how does it know that we want those layers? Well, there is an additional entity which, which is called manifest.json, right? And this manifest.json includes the image name, for example, my image. It includes which layers belong to that image, right? And additional information, so which environment variables, which command wants to spawn, etc. Okay, 
And when it's used, it's also really important that those Docker, uh, that Docker image, the layers that we are given for that, they're immutable, right? Because, for example, if another process would want to use the same layer, I mean, container image, if it would wouldn't be mutable, we couldn't reuse it, right? So basically what Docker does, it spawns an additional layer on top of it, which is writable. And this also allows us to use, for example, Docker commit, which creates a Docker image from a running container. Okay. So I told you about demo, so let's try a demo. Is it done? Okay, great. Uh, for example, now let's imagine I've just downloaded some Docker image locally from Docker Hub, right? So I got MKD here, and I'll go to the inspect. This image, I think, I hope I created it, uh, is called inspect me, right? And let's inspect it, what's going on. Well, it turns out that when using Docker, you have a lot of tools at your disposal. And one of the tools is Docker image, right? And what's most interesting part is that Docker image saved. So basically, I don't know nothing about this image, but I can save it. So what does that mean? I can go like Docker image, save, and I can type inspect me, right? And I have to tell, tell it where to output it, else it will just output it into the terminal. So I will output it to the, I guess, image.tar. Great, something happened. What can I do with this? Well, it's tar, so I can extract it. I go like tar, x for extraction, I guess, V for the verbose, because I want to see all the files that are, that are being extracted, and F for the, to specify the file. So go like image, okay. And we get a lot of stuff. So as I said, Docker packages this into layers. And there is the manifest JSON that glues everything together. So let's inspect it, JQ, and we see that, as I said, it's repotech, it's config, so in this file, there's environment variables, whatever, and you also have layers, which glue all, all of this together. So, what can we do? Well, we see that layers are still some tasks, so let's extract them. So, I'll go uh, one by one, so for, for two something, as we see, it's here. And again, I will just star, and this is the layer tar, right? And there's a lot of stuff, so basically, we can assume this is the base image. We're not interested in base image, let's say. So, let's move forward. Uh, the next one is FD something. Let's go to the FD something, and again, tar. And we see that it, FD something, there is something MTMP, TMP secret flag, great. And we find out that this secret flag exists and has some value, let's say, token to your root Azure, whatever, uh, Azure account. But, for example, now if I run this image, RM, IT, inspect me, SH, and I check the TMP folder, there's nothing there. Why, th why is that? Well, as I said, it's running in layers. So in, if I use some kind of secret in one layer and then deleted it in the next layer, it means that anyone can get that secret. So don't do that, right? Also, it means that if you're trying to slim down your Docker image by just using the last step as remove every blot I have, it won't work. It will just make your image even larger because it has to keep the diff what's changed, but it will still keep the original stuff inside of it. Okay, so that's that. Uh, how can we solve that? Well, we can use stuff, thing called uh, multi-stage builds where we use one stage to build everything and then just for the distribution, we just copy the binaries we need into the distribution. Uh, yeah, stage, which is usually based on some distro list or Alpine or whatever. Okay, now let's move forward. And we've came to the third part, which is control groups. Another Linux kernel feature uh, allows us to, uh, lim lim for the <laughs> resource limitation, I'm not sure why I'm watching here because I have it here, but okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, what does control groups do? Basically, it allows you to allocate resources, CPU time, system, network, network bandwidth, whatever, among processes. So, for example, C group one can only take that chunk of a CPU, right? So, this, this is how we basically limit how much resources can a process take. Okay, so this one, I won't talk a lot about C groups, but I'll just show it how it works. So, to find out how it works, well, just use Docker, right? So. Uh, docker run, and now what I'll do, rm, and I'll use in detached, and I'll use again. Uh, Alpine, 
and slip. And I will find this slip command, right? And it has this PID. Uh, fun fact, in every pre presentation I had, I showed how to get C group in a different way. So there are a lot of ways to interact with C groups and yeah. This is just a different one. Uh, so I can basically search for the C group that the process belongs to with C, uh, PS, with O, C group, and then I paste the process ID. And I see it belongs to the system slice something. Great. Now C groups are located in sys, fs, C group, right? And now I want to access that C group. I can just copy and paste this stuff, right? Because this, even though it's root, it's relative to this folder. I'll just cd because I can copy. So I go system, um, slice, docker, something, something, right? And inside of here, I have a lot of files. Some are read, writable, some are readable only. And the important ones are, for example, if I go like memory max, right? And it tells me that this process can use all the memory at once. Great. Well, not great if it's, if it's a Java application, but okay. Uh, now, how do we know that the process belongs to this C group? Well, yeah, we can again check, oh, it's 38821, right? So if I check the procs, C group procs, we'll see that this process ID is also here. So this is how it knows. So let's again try to do something with it. And again, I'll just use, okay, system slice, but this, I will just spawn a container, which is Docker RM, and I will go like, uh, but this time, I'll just add additional perimet perimeter uh, that limits the memory the container can use, right? So memory, 50 megabytes. And again, I'll go like Alpine, sleep, let's say 200, so I can differ differentiate from them. Oh, it's not in the, no, okay. I'll, this is the backup. Okay, uh, it's not a backup. Let's see if it's, no, I broke, no, I didn't break everything, okay. Uh, I forgot to put it, in, I forgot to detach it, right? And I can't seem to cancel it, why not? Not sure, okay, no, no time to debug. De uh, detached, remove, memory, 50, right, Alpine, sleep, and now let's say free, 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 whatever. It's D, it's D, there is, nah. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's check it out. FC, sleep, and it's free, 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 free. Okay, I can do again, PS, output, C group, whatever. Again, I can go to the FS, uh, sys, FS, whatever. Uh, C group, system, system slice, whatever, Docker, and uh, which one is one six, whatever, okay. And now this time, if I check the memory max, it's limited to the, what I just said. So basically containers use this under the hood. Okay, uh, but now this is all about this, and I just reconnect, uh, because now, okay, now let's first put everything together. You have some infrastructure, how containers work. Then you have namespace to isolate global resources. Then you have C groups to limit how much resources they can take. Then you have two things that I didn't mention. Which is first is second profile, rules that uh, restrict which system calls can be executed by that process. Then you have SA Linux, which is mandatory access control, which basically limits you which files you, you can access. And then you have user lips and bins, which are provided by the Docker image, and that, that gives you a container. So. Because we are at security conference, I wanna talk about a little bit about security as well. Um, so yeah, container escapes. What is a container escape? Basically, it means that you will escape that isolation I was talking about. Is it bad? Yeah, it's the worst thing that can happen in a container. Uh, there's also a funny quote I read, there's no container escape, just processes that want to be free, right? So, what should you take from this lecture? Uh, don't copy and paste stuff from GitHub, ChatGPT, whatever new, Git, what's, what's new now, Copilot, CLI, whatever. Think when you do that, because for example, uh, the most dangerous things that you can do is you can use a privilege flag, which is mentioned for in a lot of files on GitHub, for example, or you can even mount something which is Docker sock, right? And it's also mentioned a lot. So let's check it out, right? So first of all, when I want to talk about privilege, I need to tell you something else. So if I run, a, again, a Docker, and I will run just normal uh, Alpine with shell, right? And if, 
if I check it out, who am I? I'm a root. So what really is a privilege if I'm a root? Is it super root? Is it whatever? No. Well, it turns out that in old days, you had just root user and non-root user. And that was all. But uh, now, recently, everything is relative in yeah, IT world. Uh, Additional thing was added that kind of allows us to limit which capabilities a root user can have, right? And this is called capabilities, right? So what it, what it happens is that uh, you run a container. It means uh, that Docker will give you only those capabilities that, let's see why it's, okay. Uh, <laughs> you, uh, what I was talking about? Uh, Docker container runs, yeah, container. I mean, Docker runtime runs a container, uh, it will give you just the capabilities that Docker thinks it's safe to use inside of a container. All right, so how does it, and if you use privileged, it, you just say to the Docker, oh, let's just give me everything, right? I know what I'm doing. So what's, what, what, what can happen? Well, for example, if I'm on my host, I can see all the devices on the host. So one of these devices is also my hard drive, right? right. Well, not this hard drive because it's a VM, but okay. Now, let's do the same thing inside of a container. And we don't see everything, right? Great. But if I use privileged flag, yeah, if I could type, um, again, I see everything. So what's going on? What can I do? Well, I can check mounts, for example. I can find out which is the hard drive because this is kind of suspicious. Well, what can I do? I can just go TMP, uh, hard drive, and I will mount the device FDA1 to the TMP HD, right? And I can CD into TMP. I can even change root, right? And now I have something. So let's write a file to it. And if I now exit the container, and I check my root, we see that there is high from container, right? I've just broke the isolation. So what can I do with, I have access to all the files, it, Etsy, whatever. So basically I can do whatever. Okay, so privilege flag is bad. Also, uh, the other flag I was mentioning is the cap add. That means just give me additional capability, while the privilege means give me all the additional capability. So be careful also of the cap add as a single thing, because what I just did, you just need one flag, which is system admin flag. Okay, there's another thing, which is this weird Docker stock. So what is that? Well, it turns out that when we use Docker, this is just CLI. This does absolutely nothing. What, uh, what it does, it basically it communicates with a Docker daemon that runs on the host that runs as a root, because to create a new namespace, you need to be a root user. So how does it communicate to the root? Well, there's a thing called var run Docker stock, right? Docker CLI uses this to communicate to Docker, Docker daemon. And there are some images that require you to do like something like this, right? RM, IT, and I will mount that run docker sock, right? var run docker sock, and I will use alpine and shell. What's going on? Well, now I've put the gateway to talk with the daemon inside of my container. So I can basically talk with the daemon, docker daemon that runs on my host. What can I do with that? Well, first of all, I'm lazy, and I will install Docker CLI. I could communicate using just uh, API calls through the Docker CLI, I mean Docker SOC. And now if I run Docker PS, oops, uh, Docker PS to list all of the containers, I see I see myself because as you can remember, this is running on the host. Okay, what can I do with this? Well, I have, I'm root, I can do whatever, right? I mean, I have access to the Docker daemon, so I have access to everything. I can just go Docker run, a new, pre, a new container. I will remove it because I'm not a vandal. And I will use privileged, privileged, right? And this time, let's say I'm lazy, I'm not sure. I'm lazy, I guess. I don't you know, even wanna do hold the device something. I will just mount the root. So basically, because this stuff is running on the host, this root is basically root of the host to the some TMP host root, right? And then, what can I do now? Well, I can do a lot more, but I don't have time. I have 15 seconds, so I'll stop here. I'll just run Alpine, and now instead of shell, I can just change root, right, to the TMP host root, and I will run shell. 
and tada, I've broken out of the container, right? It's really easy to do. Uh, so yeah. Basically, this is all what I wanted to say. Uh, be careful when you're using this stuff. Uh, if it's a valid project with a lot of stars, it's sponsored by whoever, great. If it's created by a random Dimitri Vasily from Russia, probably not the best idea to use it because remember, this is like you're running stuff directly on your host. Um, yeah, okay, this is the QR code, leads to the presentation and all the scripts I just created. So if you're interested, check it out. There's also, also quite more because I explained the root and stuff, but you'll see, right? So yeah, this is all. Any questions, please? Thank <laughs> you.